السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وصحبه المنتجبين In the name of Allah, the All Merciful All praise due to him he who has sent Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, as the seal of all messengers and prophets. May he send his praise and blessings upon the master of mankind, Sayyidina Rasulullah, and upon his family, the divinely appointed inheritors of his knowledge, of his message, and of his path, that is to lead mankind to their ultimate goal, that is to reach perfection. <coughs> Assalamu alayka, Aba Abdullah. Assalamu alayka, Aba Abdullah, wa ala al arwah hallati hallat bi finaik. Alayka minni, salamu allahi abadam ma baqeet. عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين Salutations, peace be upon you, O Aba Abdullah, and upon the souls that have arrived at your courtyard. I send you salutations, peace from Allah, upon you as long as I remain and as long as the day and night remain. Let it be not the last time I visit you. Let it be not the last time I visit you. Peace upon you, Hussein, Ali ibn al Hussein, the children of Hussein, and the companions of Hussein. I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this opportunity to be amongst my brothers and sisters, the respected community at Mahfal Ali, to commemorate the 40th day after the martyrdom of Abi Abdullah al Hussein, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. Over the next half an hour, inshallah, I will share with you five points. I will speak about how the scholars have fulfilled their duty in clarifying and purifying the message of Imam al Hussein, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. And I will give an example. Second point will be a branch of the scholars fulfilling their duties an example of a taqlid, and I'll go through some historical examples of how it all started for those who claim that taqlid is a modern phenomena, is something new, it's not, it wasn't there when the Imam alayhi, went into occultation. Also, I will reaffirm the trust that our great institution, Hawz al Almiya Sharifa, is still able to produce scholars and leaders of the highest caliber. Their stance in applying the revolution of Imam al Hussein and the, mess the lessons from the revolution of Imam al Hussein to modern challenges. And finally, I will talk about one example of fighting injustice that we could and we should all do. So I'll start by the first point. Over the days of the first 10, of, 10 nights of Muharram and including up to today, today's event, myself and I'm sure you've all been involved in discussions with brothers and sisters, members of our community regarding the state of the mimbar, the state of Al-Khitab, the state of the lectures 
our stance as a community, as a nation of Muslims, of followers of Ahlul Bayt, in upholding the message of Aba Abdullah, sallallahu alayhi in truly clarifying the misconceptions associated with it, in trying to purify it from people's understandings, cultural practices, and so on. And I didn't notice it was the majority of people. In fact, it was the minority of people. But I have heard it, that some of our dear brothers and sisters do put the blame on our scholars. They say, of course, that's, you know, this is our state. We are the followers of Hussein. Listen to the lectures. Listen to the type of discussions we have. Look at our state. Some people, not the majority, alhamdulillah, but some people did blame the scholars. And they say, it's their fault. And in my first point in the talk, I will share with you, hopefully, a clarification that I would like to disagree with this minority, and I say it's not their fault. I will share with you an example of how the scholars, our maraji' have actually fulfilled their duties in clarifying the message of Hussein. However, those who have not fulfilled their duties is the Ummah. In following these scholars, and spreading the messages of these scholars, and making a bit of more effort to find out about those who've truly pure purified the message of Hussein. And today I chose an example, a modern example, of course, because, you know, we know about the beautiful, respected past examples, but our community is always looking for modern examples. We say, you know, why aren't scholars speaking about this? Why aren't the scholars advising the poets advising the lecturers, advising the centers about the way they should conduct themselves or how, how, how during the commemoration of Ashura. I will show you an example of a man who was a true embodiment and a living example of the followers of Imam Hussein because himself, himself sacrificed his life for the path of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. It's easy to talk the talk. But we have some shining examples of people who were there at the front line. Not at times of ease, at times of hardship. They put themselves forward as martyrs, as scholars and martyrs before they, t they told the Muslimin, go and put yourself forward. My example is a chapter of a book written by the late Grand Ayatollah, the martyr, Sayyid Muhammad Muhammad Sadiq al-Sadr, who was, as I hope most of you remember, was assassinated by Saddam's regime in February 1999 after he achieved one of the greatest Achievements of followers of Ahlul Bayt in modern history to revive Salat al Jum'ah in Iraq at the time of Saddam, not at times of ease, at times of difficulty, at times of hardship. He managed to redirect the attention of the youth from secular lifestyle into a religious lifestyle under the life, under the regime of the dictator, back to the Hawza, back to Islam, back to Hussein. And he paid the price. Sayyid Muhammad al-Sadr is of course the student and the inheritor of the school of his teacher, the great philosopher Sayyid Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr and he is the man who revived his teachings in Iraq in the 90s and his impact remains until today. He has a book called Adwa' ala Thawrat al-Husayn Lights upon the Revolution of Hussein. Within this book, there are many chapters. There is a chapter, the title of it is Nasa'ih lil Khutaba. A collection, set of guidelines for the preachers, those who preach about Hussein. And I will show you, inshallah, how our scholars have actually fulfilled the duties. This man wrote this book in the 90s. 
15 years ago. So for someone to come to me in London and say, where are our scholars? Why aren't they speaking about this and that? Did you make some effort in reading the life of our modern heroes? This book is written in the 90s. You can blame me for not translating it, but it's there. An example of how our scholars are fulfilling their duties. He has 12 points that he advises the khutaba, the preachers, to observe during the Muslim of Muharram or talking about Imam Hussein. Quickly, I will mention them just to give you an idea. Obviously, the details are in the book, which hopefully we will be able to translate it. He starts, say the Sadr, by saying, you have to start with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. As believers, as followers of Ahlul Bayt, you have to start your talk and lecture with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And for those who want to know the true meanings of Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, read the chapter on Al-Mizan about the great ayah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Number two, you need to use the time of Muharram to give people reminders, mawidah, irshad. It shouldn't be all about history. History has to be there. But you have to use the member to raise the level of awareness of the people with mawidah. You have to. You have to address the challenges that people face. You have to provide Islam there as a platform for them. He moves on to the third point. Obviously, I'm going over them quickly just to give you an idea of what our scholars our maraja like the preachers to be. Now, if the center and the people don't follow, then it's not the scholars to be blamed. Number three, don't hurt anyone, by language, of course, from the member. Don't use the member to hurt people or, peop or, or put other people's lives at risk. Watch what you say. Watch. What you say. Number four, avoiding associating certain phrases and certain acts that are not authentic, don't associate them with the Imams. Don't say that the Imam did this or the Prophet did that or he said this or he said that without strong evidence that he did. This idea of you reading a, a description of the imam or, a, a, or an example of a phrase the imam said and you come on the minbar or hundreds of people and thousands of people and with the YouTube, it's millions of people are listening out there. You just say it and give a reference. It doesn't matter. If it doesn't, if it's not authentic, if it's not Evidence-based that the imam actually did this, don't say he did. Avoid it. Go to the authentic. And he moves on to even... In English, I haven't heard it much, but in the, in the Arab world, this is very common. For poets and preachers not to say the imam did this, but they will say, لسان الحال. They say, this, is, this was this, the situation of the imam. As if the Imam would have said this. This is very common in Iraq, especially in poetry. On behalf of Sayyidah Zainab, and on behalf of Imam al Hussein, they say, as if the Imam would have said, and they recite. Sayyid al Sadr, a marja, a leader, he says, don't do this. Don't do this. Don't ascribe words, phrases, to the Imams and to Sayyidah Zainab that they didn't do. Unless you check with the Marji'iyah, unless you check with the real scholars that, you know, of course, Imam Hussein standing for justice, you know, that, fit, that fits with, the, with our understanding of Imam Hussein. If you want to say something along these lines, go on. But don't let your imagination loose about Imam Hussein, about Sayyidah Zainab, and try and give us some details and descriptions of Lisan al Hal. This is a marja telling the preachers what not to do. And in fact, I remember in Salat al-Jum'ah, he specifically gives an example. He didn't mention it in the book. But in Salat al-Jum'ah, he specifically said, I think it was the time of Muharram or the time of... He specifically said, this common description 
that Lady Zainab Rudwanullah ta'ala alayha in poetry commonly mentioned that she blames Al Abbas Rudwanullah ta'ala alayhi that she asks aren't you the person who brought me all the way from Medina in a way she is blaming him subtly for the situation she's saying where are you did it, did you not promise to bring me back he says this is a great injustice to lady zainab number 1 she didn't say it number 2 how dare you ascribe this to sayyida zainab how dare you this is a lady who understood fully the message of hussein you're trying to tell me that she turned into the decapitated body of abbas saying why aren't you helping me how dare you recite this on behalf of Zainab? These are not my words, brothers and sisters. These are the words of a marja'. We just have to read the works of our marja'. Six point. He says the khatib should avoid theoretical or historical descriptions that might create misunderstanding amongst the public. You know, some preachers like to, excuse me for this word, show off by mentioning a, a hadith or a description no one, no one has heard of and he leaves the audience baffled. He doesn't have time to clarify it, he doesn't know how to clarify it and then he just, you know, stick to the mainstream Islam. The message of Hussein has a lot to offer the world. Number seven, he says the khatib should avoid descriptions that might give the impression of humiliation to humiliate Imam al Hussein or his companions, whatever it is, don't say it. <coughs> Number eight, not to mention descriptions that contradict the laws of physics. The natural laws. And he gives an example of how some preachers say that Ali al Akbar was hit and the bleeding was so severe, and some of them describe even you know, his skull being fractured and more than that, and he was kind of on the floor and talking. He said, If if that happened, then the you know the warrior on the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would would have died. So to say that there was a conversation, you know, unless you avoid that and you say he was alive, yes, he was bleeding, but he talked to his father, that's possible, and that possibly did happen. But to give descriptions that contradict natural laws, avoid that. You shouldn't say it. And obviously the explanation is in the book. I'm just mentioning the points to go over them quickly. The point number nine, he says the speaker should be organized and have a structure to his lecture. Number ten, to avoid again, he gives more details about, if you don't know the meaning of a hadith, don't mention it. If you don't know the, the explanation of a verse, don't mention it. Because otherwise you will create misunderstanding with the people and the audience. And he goes on to mention number eleven and twelve, which I will... leave with you the idea that the scholar is here trying to revive amongst the people he says in your lecture and by the way be very careful have in your mind you know who's saying this this is a man who did not remain silent he says in your lecture avoid creating doubts avoid creating doubts from the member because you don't have enough time to explain it avoid creating doubts on ideas and concepts that are so general and generally accepted amongst the people don't get the impression he's saying don't analyze the words because we've just heard about 10 points he's saying analyze what you say prove, an e prove evidence show, show, show the evidence he's saying if there are certain things that 
all Muslims agree on, all followers of Ahlul Bayt agree on, avoid raising doubts from the member about them. Number one, if you have a point, you won't be able to explain it. Number two, as a speaker, and this is general advice for all of us, as a speaker, this will undermine you in the eyes of the people. So people will stop listening, hopefully, to the good messages that you're trying to preach, which are plenty. And the last point, which I think is very interesting for the brothers who did have this discussion about blaming the scholars for not doing their duties, he says, do not ascribe actions to the imams or to the families of the imams that are haram. That previous point about Zainab was in contradiction with the, with the message of Ashura, with the lessons of Ashura. Here he says, don't ascribe to them actions which are haram. And he gives one example, which is commonly mentioned also, that's after Sayyid al-Shuhada, salamullahi alayh, was decapitated. The woman, the family of al Hussein came out of the tents without hijab spreading their hairs wailing and in a state of obviously dress distress he says this is haram you can't expect lady us to believe that lady zainab the wife of and the wife of imam al hussein and the and the daughters of hussein to come out with without their hijab and commit something haram don't say that Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. <coughs> so if this is the stance of our maraji' then no one should blame the scholars for clarifying the misconceptions about the revolution of Imam Hussein. I have to share with you a concern moving to my second point. Is that lately in our community in London due to the vacuum of scholars the vacuum of clerics, the distance between us and the Hawza, it has unfortunately created some doubts in, in people's minds. This gap, whether it's a language barrier, a physical barrier, a security barrier, a cultural barrier between us and the Hawza, has created doubts in the minds of people. In fact, a lot of, a lot of youth today are asking some basic questions which are everyone is allowed to ask by the way and in fact we are the school we are the theology the followers of the theology that encourage people to ask questions even about the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but to have doubts about issues that have been discussed and discussed and discussed for hundreds of years and we've reached answers for them and because of this gap between us and the scholars and the Hawza to pretend that these new questions and concepts are modern and reviving our understanding and spreading them amongst the youth through Facebook, through lectures, is a great injustice to the blood of our martyrs and the sacrifice of our imams. To pretend that us here in London are discussing some basic concepts about like taqlid and we have a new understanding of it that we're not supposed to do taqlid, or we're not asked to do taqlid, or we don't have to do taqlid, on, and it's so difficult to do taqlid, and since when we did taqlid anyway? To try and spread this as a new concept, as something that no one has thought about before, and we need to do this because these people in Najaf and Qum are so backwards. They have no idea of what life is. We are the ones, you know, living in Western society in first world. We're going to teach them how to understand Islam. We're going to teach them how even the concepts of Islam. What do they know? What did Muhammad Baqir Sadr know anyway? What did Khomeini know? What did the Mutahari know? What did Muhammad Sadr know? You sit with the brother and say, okay, you go to Arba'in? Let's go to the Hawza. Let's pick a random mujtahid. And let's discuss these concepts that you claim are new. Shall we? No. I'll just keep updating, bombarding my Facebook status with doubts and creating doubts 
in the community, and I'm not going to come and discuss this with the mushtahid. Brother, they all turn up to, well, most of them turn up to Hajj. You go to Hajj? Let's go together. There are, there are Asati that from the Hawza in Hajj. Let's sit with them and talk. Why is it just the Facebook and the teenagers who can barely read Arabic that you want to speak to? Let's just speak to the teachers. No, I'm going to operate in the periphery. At an area, at a zone, in an expanding Muslim ummah that no one can catch me. The Hawza doesn't know English. They're not going to be able to refute me. I'm going to just work here. Well, brother, you're saying this concept needs to be, you need to reform the whole house. Let's just talk to them. No. Leave me alone. I know better. I'm going to just go quickly over some names that I'd like my brothers and sisters to know about them. For those who think this taqlid concept came recently. Let's start chronologically. I'm going to run through some names of scholars, maraja' who existed at that transient time between al-ghayba al-sughra and al-ghayba al-kubra. Al-ghayba al-sughra ended year 324, yes? 69, 70 years after the birth of Imam al-Mahdi, 255. I hope you all remember these dates, by the way. So, some might like to propose there was a vacuum apparently in the leadership of the Muslim Ummah. There were no scholars and maraja until the times of Shaykh al-Mufid and Shaykh al-Tusi. There was a gap of about 100, 250 years. What did the Shia do? Who were they following? Oh really? Well, let's listen to this then. So, Al-Kulayni who wrote... This great encyclopedia, Kitab al-Kafi, lived at the time of al-Ghayb al-Sughra and he actually died five years after its end. So he was into al-Ghayb al-Kubra. The Imam has stopped all indirect contact with the people through his sufara. Five years afterwards, al-Kulayni died. So just bear that figure. Five years, Kulayni was still there and other great scholars. I'm just giving some famous names. Forty-five years after the beginning of Ghayb al-Kubra, al-Faqih al-Umani died. Forty-five years. So this man lived at the time of the Imam al-Ghayb al-Sughra for about 15 years. He was there when al-Kulayni was there in his 20s and he died 45 years after. Al-Faqih al-Umani. I don't expect many of you to know about him because guess what? We don't read history. We don't read about our scholars. Faqih al-Umani, also known as Ibn Abi Aqil, died just 45 years after the beginning of Al-Ghayb al-Kubra. Listen to a description by Al-Allama al-Tabatabai, Sayyid Mahdi al-Tabatabai and Sayyid Hassan al-Sadr. Listen about the description of the followers of Ahl bayt at his time. They say, the Hujjaj from Khurasan, from Iran, would only perform Hajj, this is 45 years into Al-Ghayb Al-Kubra, no gap, would only perform Hajj with a copy of the book of Faqih Al-Umani Ibn Abi Aqil Al-Mutamassik Bihabli Al Rasul. He had a book, a fiqhi book, not a hadith book, not like uh, Al-Kafi, he had a fiqh book, the followers of Ahl bayt today, when they go with the Risala Amaliyya in their hands, which is not a hadith book, it's a fiqhi book, and they go, Safa al Marwan, they like to check the books and say, What does the faqih say? This was the practice of the followers of Ahl bayt within 45 years of Al Ghayb al Kubra. The Hujjaj from Khurasan would not perform Hajj without a copy of the book of Al Faqih al Umani. Don't tell me there was a gap. Don't tell me we did not do taqlid right from the beginning of Al-Ghayb al-Kubra. And then it continues after Faqih al-Umani, there was a Shaykh al-Saduq who died 57 years, so 15 years after Faqih al-Umani, and then Shaykh al-Mufid, 30 years after, and then it all started Shaykh al-Najashi and the rest you know about. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.
So there was no gap, brothers and sisters. And more discussion needs to be done with the teachers of the Hawza. So it takes me to my third point. We should put our trust in the Hawza. We should put our trust in the religious institution. We should put our trust in this investment of the imams that they worked so hard to create. Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, the narrators say, the historians say, 4,000 students all narrate, we were told by Abi Abdullah Ja'far. This investment to create these narrators and fuqaha, don't let go of it. Don't let go of it because of some YouTube clips. Don't let go of it because of a lecture here and there. You were all living in the 20th century. Haven't you seen what these maraja have done for us? I know there are people who have probably have let you down. But the blood, Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr, Wasn't he just an average man like every single one of us? He wanted to see his daughters and his son married and successful and have graduation. But he decided to let go of all this. And yet we say within 30 years of his departure, we say the Hawza have let us down. The scholars have let us down. You know, No trust, no hope. Who's leading the struggle against the Zionists today? Isn't it the Hawza? Isn't Saint Hassan a product of the Hawza? Who established the Islamic Republic? Wasn't it the Hawza? Who fought the American occupation in Iraq? Wasn't it the Hawza? Who fought Saddam? Who's fighting in Bahrain now? Isn't it the Hawza? Who does Sheikh al namr belong to? Is he a secular man or is he a product of the Hawza? The Hawza, the Hawza, the Hawza. Yet it's so easy in London. To sit there and criticize the Hawza. 4th point coming to the end we should learn from the Hawza and the Maraja how to draw lessons from Karbala to modern challenges today the Palestinians admit that if it was not for for the support of the followers of Ahlul Bayt, they would not be able to resist. To hold Palestine as a central cause in our journey to fight for justice is the path of the ulama, which is the embodiment of the path of Hussein. Don't let go of Palestine because of the sectarian tension. Don't say it's an Arab-Israeli conflict. It's, you know, most Palestinians follow a certain sect. It's none of our business. Or you don't completely agree with the people who are now fighting for the freedom of Palestine. You don't agree with them completely, so you just completely let go of it. Our scholars and Palestine is just one example. Bahrain is another example. Our scholars have taught us to put these central causes like Palestine at the heart of the message of Ashura. We all remember the speeches of Imam al-Khumayni about this. And even Sayyid Muhammad al-Sadr, when he was living under the dictatorship of Saddam, as I said, not at times of ease, at times of hardship. From the member in the 90s, when Iraqis were under the American sanctions that destroyed their morality, when they were ruled by the most vicious dictators, they were poor, they were uneducated, they had no hope, yet he came out to them and said, we need to support Palestine. So that we should draw some modern lessons, we should have some modern applications of the message of Abu Abdullah, especially at the time of Arba'in, following the footsteps of our scholars. Not an invention by us. And I'll leave you with the last point just as a thought. Some of you might say, okay brother, so fighting injustice, Palestine is at our heart, 
We'll never let go of it. But tell us about a cause we could follow here in the UK. Many people will say, well, you know, I'm, I'm with you. I'm all for Palestine, for the rights of Palestinians to return, for justice. But what about here in Britain? Is the message of Imam al-Hussein only ascribed to those under dictatorships, under occupation? Can we do something here? And I'm not trying here to make up something for you, by the way. I'm not trying to package something that's not there. But there's a genuine question amongst especially the youth in our community. What do we do here? Here in Britain. I will leave you with an example. And I'll leave the discussion for later, inshallah. I will remind you of a verse in the Quran that says, Surah Luqman, chapter 31. Luqman tells his son, أعوذ بالله من شر الشيطان اللعين الرجيم يا بني لا تشرك بالله إن الشرك لظلم عظيم يا بني لا تشرك بالله إن الشرك لظلم عظيم My son, do not associate others with Allah. Shirk, shirk is a great injustice. Shirk is a great injustice. Brothers and sisters, followers of Ahlul Bayt, look around you. The children in Britain, do you feel responsible towards them? I know you feel responsible towards your children. But what about these innocent souls out there in Britain and the rest of Europe? Do you feel responsible? Do you feel that it's, it's part of me as a human being and indeed as a Muslim, as a follower of Ahlul Bayt to do something for their success and for them to achieve their potential, happiness and perfection? If you don't feel that, then I apologize. But for those who do, for those who do, this child who today in modern Britain is being taught a lifestyle, an understanding about life that hides away from him. You know, they want this child to grow, develop, reach, assumingly, his potential, hiding away from him the most important fact in the universe the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala need to be the foundation on which this child would form his understanding of the world and achieve his potential. When the educational establishment, when the media, when us as a society are all participating in this Continuous process of hiding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from public life. Hiding God and religion. Pushing it away from society. What do you think we are doing to the future of the children in, the, in this country? Today people, brothers and sisters, are struggling to argue against the, the government's proposal to approve same gender marriage even though the vast majority of the people in Britain disagree with this but because the most basic fact the foundation, the existence of Allah and his presence in public life the, public, the, the presence of religion has been hidden away from us for decades people are struggling to argue against this against the government the government obviously wants to teach us what marriage is now I thought societies have thinkers and they have politicians. But now the politicians are teaching us about what, what's right and what's wrong and what's marriage and what's not marriage. Which is a, a great disaster in my understanding of public life. It's not the job of politicians to tell us what's right and what's wrong. So people are struggling to argue against this proposal because the foundation on which you have an argument is not there. It should have been there. God should have existed in public life. 
right from the beginning. So if you feel responsible towards the message of Imam al Hussein to fight injustice, there is a great injustice being served here in Western world, depriving future generations of the most essential fact in the universe, that's the existence of Allah, on which they should have based their whole lifestyle and ideology. And if we don't do anything about it, then we're simply not fighting for justice. I will finish here, and I ask for the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the shortcomings, and I apologize about the delay, and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless the center and the respected community here with a deeper and a pure understanding of the message of Imam Hussein sallallahu alayhi commemorating him on the night of Al-Arba'een. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you all with the intercession, with shafa'at, Abi Abdullah al Hussein, the man who protected and saved religion for the generations to come. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst, amongst those who support him and remain of his followers until the end of time. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Thank you very much. Um, now we've got some time for some question and answers. Um, so who'd like to begin? There is a microphone on the ladies and the gents' side. So. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much for refuting one of the arguments as you mentioned about taqlid <laughs> in the modern times, Asa. that it did exist in the beginning and there wasn't a big gap. Um, but I struggle to understand what I perceived as a contradiction in your in your talk. Now, uh, I'd be grateful if you can clarify it for me. <coughs> you mentioned that we're allowed to ask questions about even things about the existence of God, which is the cent which or of of Allah, which is a central central issue of Islam and Tawheed. But you seem to have mentioned that other things that have already been dis discussed and concluded, namely taqlid, shouldn't be asked. No, that's a very different approach altogether than saying that you're allowed to ask questions, but here is the refutation or the answer to your questions. Ahsan, can I clarify? Of course, I invite every single human being to think from the existence of Allah through taqlid to the ghayb of Mal Mahdi. And I invite such brothers who have questions and sisters about, okay, name us the first marja who existed. When did he live? What was it all about? What was the practice of Shia? No doubt, brothers and sisters, feel free to ask questions. Have the trust that over the last 12 centuries, we will, alhamdulillah, have answered almost all the questions. Indeed, about concepts that have been raised before. What I'm against, my dear brother, is for you not to accept to ask, but to go on Facebook. Uh, forgive me, I'm not saying yourself, but I'm saying... For those who have this modern call, not to engage in a Q&A clarification from the knowledgeable ones. No, just go for the YouTube. Go for Facebook and say, this is how it should be. That's what I'm against. Absolutely. Let's ask, let's discuss, let's ask the knowledgeable people. However, don't just ignore us all and ignore 12 centuries of, of hard work and say, I found it. Here it is on YouTube. I hope this clarifies it. Uh, you mentioned the name of a book that described Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Do you mind to just repeat it again, the name the, of the book? The book that was written by Al-Faqih Al-Umani. Is it Faqih, about Bismillah Rahman Rahim? Oh, sorry, I was talking about the explanation of Ayatul Basmala. And I said... Oh, Ayatul Basmala. Yes, okay. yes, yes. What was the... Is it the book described that or is it... No, no, I, I, just, I just was highlighting that... When Sayyid al-Sadr, in his first advice to preachers, say, start with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Yeah, yeah, that's, yes, that's the yeah. one. What is the name of that book? Uh, Tafsir al-Mizan. Taf oh, Tafsir al-Mizan, yeah. Alama Tawatabai. Alama Tawatabai, absolutely. Do you, know, do you know which volume is that? It's right at the beginning, in Surah Al-Fatiha. Oh, okay. Right at the beginning. Um, um, that doesn't mean I don't believe in um, Imam Mahdi, I do. 
but brother, I want you Please. to make a very good research for yourself. Sure. Don't take my words for it. Um, unfortunately, research shows historically we can't prove Imam Mahdi exists. That's our problem. H historically? Okay. Yeah, no. So so of course. I do believe in Imam Mahdi. Yeah, yeah, no, of course. But let's historically, let's we can't prove. Let, let, let me clarify. Obviously, um, we should have, inshallah, a whole lecture about historically proving the existence of Imam Mahdi. Um, but again, I'm quite, I proudly say that not based on emotions, but Muhammad Baqar al Sadr, not based on emotions did a historical research and gave a very short and concise argument about the 69 years and the behavior of four known individuals among society at the time, that's Ibn Nawab, and how we could draw from that based on uh, the rules of probabilities. Again, this great man was a kind of re trying to use two sorts of evidence, history, historical events, but not just because you like history or you find a reference in a book then and then you, you like it, but also applying the laws of probability into the performance of 69 years of four different people and how he used that to prove that the Imam Mahdi actually did exist. So alhamdulillah, not based on emotions, but historically and mathematically, our scholars have already did it and have already proved that the Imam did exist. But inshallah, we'll have a different time in which we shall clarify it. There's a question from the sisters. Any from the brother? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sorry about that. Yeah. I was just wondering if, you, uh, to, to clarify a couple of questions that, that I had. Um, when it comes to the idea of taqlid that we've been talking a, bit, a little bit about here, um, it's, it's difficult to, to pinpoint and say that there were, of course, there were scholars right up, you know, Kalaini onwards. But uh, even in Al Kafi, there's nothing on, there's nothing specifically on taqlid. <coughs> Kalaini was a an akhbari in, in in essence, and the whole idea of taqlid for him would have been something slightly different to what we'd understand taqlid to be today. I mean, yeah. yes, a concept that we can call taqlid can have existed throughout time, but the understanding of it has, by its very nature, very much changed through time. You know. The way that we believe taqlid to be right now is very similar to the Ansari concept of, of taqlid, post-Ansari, when we have a more alamiya concept. I, I, it, it seems difficult to, to be able to um, be sure about s saying something like taqlid has always been there. You know, maybe that concept might have been there, but it's massively morphed through time. I, I think most people would have, would have uh, that as, as sort of a factual basis, I, I can't see how that 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 works. So that's the first question I have. If if, um, if you allow me, a second question Please. is more on on the whole uh, idea of the hosa uh, and it's um, and a lot of critique that of course is done throughout the world, th throughout the Western world specifically. Um, I mean, Shahid Muhammad Sadr was one of those who who very much revolutionised hosa and and, and was one of the proponents of of massively changing a lot of what was going on within the Hosa from, from the subjects, from the way it was taught, from, way, from everything with that within the, the Hosa system. Um, and he, he obviously came with a, with a great uh, depth of knowledge and understanding which was able to, to, to drive this forward. In our current day where a lot of people are specializing in different areas, um, and maybe some people here have different views and different thoughts on how you can Im improve education and um, develop specialization and, and, and uh, get to the pinnacle of education and excellence. Isn't, is there a possibility that others may feel that a reform of the Hosa in a different way may, re may yield even better results going forward? And should we not try and you know, be at the frontiers of of Tajdeed and be the Mujaddid of our age. Let me start with the second point. Um, positive criticism, all for it. You want to positively criticize the Hausa and say, this is where we are, and this is great, and we want to take the following extra steps to make it better, I'm all up for it. 
Han Baqar al-Sadr was an example. Muhammad al-Sadr was an example. Did you know that Muhammad al-Sadr under Saddam, an application of his teacher's approach to modernizing Hawza, he actually opened a college in which all the Hawza students had to study English, English, chemistry, biology, physics, maths, and sociology. This is not from someone who is in London. This is from a man who never left Iraq, working in the, you know, the worst conditions you can think about, and he was reforming the Hawza. So positive criticism to appreciate what we have and take it a few steps forward, we are all up for it. What I'm against is this attitude of looking down on the Hawza and saying, you guys are centuries behind us. We've been taught in the West, and I've been taught in the West, by the way. I don't know exactly what Western education is. So this attitude, this kind of, if, if I may say, takabbur attitude, that I know it all because I'm in the West, and you don't, you know nothing because you were just, you never left Iraq and Iran. Reformation from within. If, you, if your attitude towards this reformation is that you're one of us, you know, you work with the existence house to improve. Don't tell me there are teachers in Qom and Najaf who are not working day and night to do these, who are looking for, okay, show us a, you know, a, a better way of uh, teaching, for example. Are you using what, visual aids? What are you using? Yeah? And so on. Again, Sayyid Muhammad al-Sadr was the first merger to have PCs in his house. He actually had computers teaching the, the, the house students. Only if we know what the house is doing. So by all means, positive criticism, working from within, or if you're here, working with the house to improve it, is absolutely our dream. But don't look down on it. Don't assume that just because you have a, a Western qualification, and you read more, more books translated than them, then you know better. So by all means. And as you said, the call for reformation improvement has come from within the house. So this is not an outsider call. What I'm against is for a member of my community to attach himself to a stranger. A stranger, i.e. not a member of our community. Doesn't know anything about us doesn't know about the history of the Hawza. Trying to reform the Hawza by attaching yourself to an outsider who, th who you think will know how to reform a system that existed for 12 centuries, I'm against that. I don't think you, you will be successful. I don't think you're able to do it. So if you want to reform from within, attach yourself to someone within the Hawza. And there are so many people out there. There, you can meet them in Ziyara and Hajj and Umrah who are who are looking forward to working with you. Regarding taqlid as a concept, we understand it. The taqlid I'm referring to, which obviously some people will say, well, w was it actually mentioned by word taqlid? Obviously, it may not have been mentioned taqlid. Yeah? The concept of taqlid is a very simple concept in which the mukallaf, the Muslim, Your, yourselves and myself, we have three options. Three options for, for providing some evidence on the Day of Judgment why we prayed the way we did. If it's a herd mentality, then be careful. Be very careful on the Day of Judgment to say, Oh, Allah, I, uh, this was my adhan because the people in my neighborhood performed adhan this way and I you know, was allowed to do this and that because the people around me you should have some strong argument in your grave and on the day of judgment to why you did this particular thing so you have simply three options you either study it and, and feel free to do that you perform the ishtihad you do the ihtiyat taqlid is you, you return in these questions about the details of fiqh I know you're looking for philosophy, economics and all these different concepts. But I'm talking about fiqh. Purely fiqh. Returning to a specialist in fiqh. And one of the sisters lately in the Muslim Student Council conference, when I was talking about this again, she said to me, brother, in the world of medicine today, there are specializations. Right? It's not all in one. 
if you want a, if you have a broken leg, you go to an orthopedic surgeon. If you have anemia, you come to a hematologist. He has to say this. Yeah, so you have a specialization. So we need marajah who are specialists. My argument against this is, you've got a, a bit of misconception if I might disagree. We follow the marajah on the formulas. On the formula. He has a formula of what's halal and haram. You bring the variables, you ask him the question, the, for, the result is there. This is halal, this is haram. This is how you do it, this is how you do it. We're not saying that you do taqlid in the economical model that Muhammad Baqir Sadr did. Don't, get, don't confuse things. We're not saying you do taqlid to Muhammad Baqir Sadr in his philosophy. No one does taqlid to Muhammad Baqir Sadr in his philosophy. He wrote philosophy in his philosophy as a scholar, as a writer. You agree with it, you disagree with it, you take it. You don't perform taqlid to him in his philosophy. You perform taqlid in, in the fiqh. So specialization and the branching sciences by all means, but we're not asking people, we're not saying that the practice of the followers of Alibayt has been to do uh, taqlid in all branches. We're saying they do taqlid in fiqh and fiqh only. Formulas that have existed, very simple, very basic. The discussion about the most knowledgeable or not, I'll leave it for another time, inshallah. I think we've unfortunately run out of time. <laughs> um, I know it can go on. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Said Hassan Sadr, and can we Allah thank him again? With Salat Ala Muhammad, Wali Muhammad.